So it's Sunday evening. I don't think we'll make a start on this. It's Midland 3001. It's pretty immaculate. Um, it was made in February 1982. It comes with the proper power lead and it comes with proper mic. So uh, I have to look back on his email, but it's something about something being intermittent and he wondered whether it was capacitor ish. Was it channels dropping out? That's been that's the countersunk screw when you use it with that slide bracket which these came with. So that's actually correct. Better put the soldering iron on because we know what's coming. The speaker will need unsoldering. So may as well take that lid off. Apart from a slight smell of nicotine, it's uh, pretty good. Of course, they're 38 years old now, so. Get that. Pooh! Smith. <laughs> Nearly as bad as smoke coming out of that Moonraker set. Why is it all bent round there? It is, you know, it's bent. Uh, well, you see, it's got the crystal filter added, and do I know that's done right? You know, so... You know, I've just got to assume and not um, look back on other people's work, haven't I? So as long as it receives, I have to assume that's right. But it's a 10 point... 10.6 M7. See, we don't fit. We don't do these modifications, so I have no idea what's right and what's wrong. So I'm not here to do that. I'm here to stop this thing being intermittent. And if we power this up, I'll just take my patch lead away. That's off my ham radio gear the other day. That could be the VCO on this, but it could be right, it could be some capacitor somewhere, and I just uh, will have to look back on what he said. Hope it lights up because I don't relish doing the bulbs on these. So I'm switching it on, and it's not even got the power lead in. So we need it in DX, we need it in CB, and I want the filter out. So we've got that coming through, let's look at transmit. So it's on frequency, it's virtually, it's so spot on I won't need to touch it. I know you've seen all these chassis before, but you know, I think people like to see the repairs even if they've seen them a dozen times before, because they're all going to be different. It's not just an alignment, it is a repair. So that's spot on frequency. Let's go for picture in picture. 
That's pressing the picture in picture button now. So if there's no picture in picture, I did press the button, and we're now on the meter, the power meter, and the radio is doing. Oh, it's doing a good three watts. Let's have a look what it's really doing. It's doing three point six, and that'll be the absolute maximum, wouldn't it, on a modern set? And it doesn't look messed with, apart from that crystal filter. Let's look what the deviation is. Let's tune that in. One, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. I'm on AM. No wonder I'm not getting anywhere. One, two, one, two, one. Whoa, that needs to come down. Whoa, look, it's three and a half. We're coming through on three channels at once doing that. So let's see what the receive's doing. You know what? It sounds awful. The receive sounds awful. And if I put this on the cyanide meter, it's dancing around all over the place. So for 12 decibel cyanide, it's doing two and a half microvolts. I bet this doesn't get any bleed over. <laughs> oh dear. Treads on radio chassis that's on the floor. Right, I'm going to find a piece of second-hand paper because we're too tight to have new ones. I've looked at his email, he says when he keys the mic, it shuts down after a bit. I have to put a rubber band around the mic and, uh, and walk away for an hour. Just see if there's something we can do with this receive. It's uh, absolutely awful. Now, have we got anything middle and three thousand and one kicking around? Is that the circuit? Is that the one? No, that's a different Maxon. We have to dig the manual out because I've got a memory like a sieve. I don't normally start on receive, but we will on this occasion. We know it's spot on frequency because that receive is so awful I think he said I mean he's got he said you've got a noisy volume control but it's not noisy for me right so we'll just put I'll tell you what we'll start with this detector because uh, on these Maxon chassis sets that's something that can go out so I'll put the oscilloscope on, we'll put the camera on that. We'll turn the volume up a bit and I'll put an S9 equivalent signal on of 100 microvolts. So the detector is down there. It's not that. Right, well, we'll see whether we can give it a bit of a tune-up. The answer is, is yes to that. I 
Is that transmitter? Let's just check. Yep, that's transmitter. Right, well, let's see what the cyanide is now. Oh, it's made a tool on the floor. It's certainly improved, but is it improved enough? It's now 0.59, 0.6 of a microvolt, so actually it has improved enough. It's all over the place. Okay, so let's look at the transmit. So there's something thermal. This should, uh, five minutes of tuning it up, should um, find out whether it's playing up or not. So there we are at... Uh, well, it's dropped a bit, it's 3.4 watts, but of course it, they do drop with heat. We know that one's right because I checked it earlier. So that's spot on. It's brought it up a fraction. Brought it up to four. I'll have to get that. It goes to about 4.2, so I have to remember which way we have to tune it, whether it's clockwise or anti clockwise for uh, the four watt setting. But having done that roughly, let's just see where we are with this. So we're on channel 20 and it's keying at 4 watts. We go on to channel 40. It's keying at 4.2 watts. We go on to channel 1 and it's keying at 4 watts. So the VCO can't be out because it's working on all 40 channels. But there is this noise. Go take the tone off, put an S9 signal on, and turn the volume up. It's not there. So that's three microvolts. That's one microvolt. So once you go over 0 0.8 microvolts, it's not doing any of that instability. I just wonder if the test set's generating that. I mean, you can't always tell. Um, but as for him saying it goes off, well, I'm sure I'm sure I believe him. Let's monitor the eight volt rail. Uh, is it floating on this? I'll I'll tell you what. I'll put this on the. On the power connector, the negative to the meter. Let's monitor that. Eight volts spot on. Wow, that is spot on. Let's key it up. So I'll put the probe back on there. I 
reason why it's going up, gone up to 8.22. The input side. That's the voltage drop across the uh, the various input leads, isn't it? Twelve point nine seven. I just monitored that at the power supply lead. And the other power supply lead. Yeah, it's a little drop there. Well, you know, I can't make this do it. This, so I'm gonna. We'll leave this radio on overnight. So I've tuned it, it's doing 4 watts, I just need to verify with the uh, service manual uh, with that code whether it needs to be clockwise or anti-clockwise. Um, so I'm satisfied the receives now there. I don't like crystal filters uh, as a retrofit item, I, you know, I'm never sure whether they're right or wrong. But uh, it's it's receiving, so hey, you know it, it stays, doesn't it? It's not like it's illegal, um, but it isn't playing up for me. It was saying, you know, touching the volume control, and it was a bit iffy. But it isn't. And these aren't really a set that suffer from dry joints either. I think the um, the blanket answer is to, if this does play up at all, in fact, if it doesn't play up at all, the blanket answer, I think, is to change the electrolytic capacity there and the regulator IC there. But I think I'll leave it on overnight and... Um, We'll see how it goes. I'll come back to this tomorrow. So we'll see what what the radio enjoys doing overnight. So I'll see you tomorrow. So it's half past eight the next morning, and I think we've finished uh, up with this about half past eight the evening before. So it's twelve hours later. The radio has been on all night. Uh, just sat there on very low volume on the workbench like that, and it's transmitting absolutely spot on every time I want it to one two testing one two so all we can do is from his uh, description all we can do is is just change the voltage regulator and change that capacitor I think that's what we'll do let's have a look in our Midland file well, we've got the cir the best circuit is for the uh, 2001. It's the uh, same difference. Um, so let's have a look at that circuit. I say there must be another page. So I that's going to be IC one hundred three, I think. Let's just check with the layout. Yeah, IC one hundred three. So. The capacitor, the capacitors, they're, they're not electrolytic, so they can't um, be problematic, really. 
so if he thinks the transmit goes down, it's going to have to be robbing the VCO of uh, of power. So it's got to be the eight volt rail going down. So capacitor one nine five or one nine six, I think that says, could also cause the output of the IC. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not looking on the bigger picture. Two one three is electrolytic as well. So which is two one three? Two one three is there. I, I can't replicate this fault and this is always the problem many years ago when I had a television business the consumer magazine which did a test with my repair services which I still to this day 38 years later seemed unfair they doctored a television set and put a blown fuse in one of the, I can't remember which fuse it even was, because you're going to have more than one, you're going to have the mains fuse, you're going to have a high tension fuse. Uh, I think it was a solid state television. And I can't even remember whether it was colour or black and white. But anyway, um, they doctored uh, this television and brought it in for service, just as, as a normal set, so because I wasn't aware it was which magazine doing a test. And I soon found that it was a dead set because of a blown fuse. So what you do is you take the fuse out and you see how it's blown. If the wires have just parted inside the fuse, because they're all glass fuses, aren't they, on these type of products? They're not like the ones in, in mains plugs. You know, we, we have these glass fuses, and you know what I'm on about, but I can't see any to show you right here. For once, I haven't got any kicking around. Anyway, um... I looked at the fuse and it was quite violently parted. So you think, well, something shorted that. So I think I changed the bridge rectifier and a few capacitors, which were a possibility. And I think that the service charge in those days was something like seven pounds fifty, and it was probably. I think the probably the probably the whole bill was about fifteen quid. But I, I changed the, the bridge rectifier and, and some associated components. About like what we're doing here in this 12 volt radio. And then they published a league of tables as to who was the best uh, television repair person. And I certainly wasn't um, in the ripoff section. You know, people who go, oh, well, oh, oh, it's the cathode ray tube, that is. <laughs> That'll be £100, please, you know. So, no, uh, but conversely, the bloke who said, well, it was just a fuse, gives a cup of tea. You know, that's not right either, because that's a, that's a lie. You look at that fuse, and you use that your um, knowledge, both your training and your expertise in, um, in years of doing these things, as to what it can be. So that was which magazine. And then when they did the report on CB radios and said, a lot of these sets are the same chassis depending on the model. Like the same with this, isn't it? The 2001, the 3001, 4001, it's all the same chassis. And they wrongly said, so better value for the Fidelity range would be the Fidelity 1000. Well, we all know the Fidelity 2000, the Fidelity 1000 are very different chassis. And at that point, I stopped subscribing to which magazine. So I think we're going to change that 8 volt regulator. I can't make it do what the customer says, despite it having been on for 12 hours. And you know what's going to happen? He's going to have a snag at his end, although this, I know this isn't his only CB radio. He's an end user. Because I've done others for him. But it just makes you think that... Is he drawing... When you go into transmitting, it draws one and a half amps. Has he got a bit of a, a duff fuse? 
in his vehicle installation? Does he have a power supply that shuts down a bit? I don't know. If I remember rightly, these are a, a 7808. And we're going to have one maker or another of 7808. I can take it out quite safely. I'll laugh my socks off if I've then got to order one from RS. Now, why hasn't it gone through the holes? It's, um... Let's just make sure we're on the right camera. So, it's just on the outer track. Oh, well. I have known these go down, but usually, you know, they do go down and and you've got no 8 volt rail, but uh, I, you know, you, you could have that intermittent thing. And as we say, it could also be one of the capacitors. So it's just a matter of doing a blanket job. All these kind of parts are so cheap anyway, it really doesn't matter. Let's see whether we can, they're the wrong pliers. I'd normally send these sets across to Chippy's bench to be um, have the parts changed. Seven eight M O eight, isn't that a lesser one? I'll tell you what, it's a Motorola. Right, well that goes in our vertical filing cabinet. Now I don't like the look of that electrolytic and it's 38 years old so although this is on the input side we'll change it anyway. I'll test it, we'll put it I'm not putting it back if it tests okay. It's one of those that doesn't want to unsolder. So negatives to my left. I think that's glue rather than uh, than gunk. So a thousand microfarads at sixteen volts. So we will test that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's getting a bit high. And again, that's indicative of, uh, of not being that well. It doesn't have the kind of top that can pop, so it's going to shoot its guts out from underneath. But it hasn't done. I'm absolutely convinced that that's glue. But we'll change it anyway. So out of interest, we'll test the new smaller one. This is 105 degree rated, so we're not that we need to up the temperature, but well, that's what we stock. So that's that, that's new. So negative to the left. So with a new smaller component in there, this radio will weigh less and he'll get more to the gallon out of his car. 
when I was a little boy and took a comic, was it Whizzer and Chips or was it Knockout? And there's a page of corny jokes, and one of these was, how did the uh, Spaniards, how did the ancient Spaniards measure their fuel economy of their of their um, sh fleet of ships? And it was miles to the galleon. And it still makes me snigger all these years later. Right, so that's changed that. Um, I'll have to go to a different department and see if we can find a 7808. Oh, well, the good news is we've got one in stock. Now, we've got a stock control system here, as you can well imagine, with about 12,000 different components in stock. And um, it's always difficult to, what to charge. There's actually a law in Britain that you can't remark up things that are already for sale. I don't know whether that's still valid, but it certainly was. There was a time when inflation was so bad in the 70s that you could go in a supermarket and by the time you got to the checkout, the prices had changed. So we have this stock control system. This is the printout for November 1998. So you can see it's pretty recent. And when I come to um, 7808, what we will always do, because they come in various makes, we will always use UA 708. 7808. So all that series of uh, all that series will be attributed with UA, which would be NEC. But of course there are other brands, and what's come out is LM, and it's a Motorola. So what is fascinating is the one we've got in stock, which is an MC7808, is a Samsung. So it's a Korean part going in a Korean radio. What do you reckon to that? And they were we paid um, ninety nine point eight seven five pence for them in nineteen ninety eight. So if I add nothing on. We'll charge him a quid. I just need to make sure I've got some thermal paste on that and then we'll we'll get it put in. And then behind the scenes I took out capacitor was it capacitor one nine four, that one I showed you on the circuit. I put it on the tester, what is it? Ten microfarad sixteen volts. In circuit it's faulty so that was a correct diagnosis now theoretically I could put the original 7808 back I'm not going to do that because if this has been shorting um, and shorting out that regulator it's going to be very hot and shutting down because the heat is being generated so although it didn't play up for me it was a very real fault at the end of the day the customer wouldn't have sent it in and gone to all that expense of boxing it up and um, and the fact we are going to charge him something um, he wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been for real so I'll get a replacement capacitor and we don't have the 16 volt ones and once again it'll be upgraded to 105 degrees because that's what we stock So I suppose when it's got the lids on, and with that potential short circuit around the synthesizer, that probably got very hot and then shut down, as he says. Why 
have I got the blunt cutters? Right, I'll go and find some thermal heat compound because Mr. C normally changes the parts if to be on his bench. Right, so I've put that on. We'll just get the multimeter and we'll just see if there's any point at which this capacitor I've taken out actually shows up as faulty on a multimeter. So on the ESR meter it says it's in circuit. So with an ordinary multimeter at 20k, no problem. 200k no problem but it's not going up and coming down like you'd expect it to charge and oh it is just that bit so it doesn't show up as faulty on a multimeter it's not like it's dead short but it is faulty and it fits in with what the customer says so new 7808 down there so we'll power the radio back up. Yeah, okay, so the power's now higher. We're now at 4.4 watts. And that surprises me because the earlier stages, I, you know, are either tuned or not tuned in my uh, book. Now, I just needed to know which, whether it's... Um, to the right or to the left for the set four watts bit of that coil. So we'll just look at that. When all the coils are peaked, the transceiver power meter should indicate more than four watts. Turn 115, which is the one we're talking about anti clockwise, to reduce to 3.8 watts. But we don't do 3.8 watts, we do four watts. It's anti-clockwise. It's important this, otherwise you end up with the balance between channels being wrong. 41 are equal. Hey, done it. So they're all equal at 4 watts. Well, that's better. Now we need to deal with that deviation as without getting the manual back out. It's one of those two, isn't it? Let's get the little oscillator wherever I've hidden it. There it is. Wallow. One, two, wallow. That's better. And the meter on the radio, we'll put that back. It's reading right across the scale. That's now reading just over the four. So that leaves us with, I don't recall these have an S meter adjustment, do they? Because it's on the back of the meter when it does. Yeah, so we've done the, uh, we've done transmit. So I'll have a final check of the FM demodulator. We'll put S9 on the test equipment, turn the bench light off, switch, switch to the oscilloscope, just make sure we've got absolute peak on that coil. Now 
I would say we have. So we lined this yesterday and we got... Didn't I write any of this down? So it's 0.55 microvolts for 12 dB cyanide, which is what you expect. So we'll put S9 on the meter. Take picture in... Oh, I've not had picture in picture on. That's my fault this time. So... It's reading S9, and on this version it isn't adjustable. So what we do need to do is set the squelch. So this time we'll put picture in picture on, and we'll go over to the attenuator controls. Switch the signal generator off, switch the squelch to full. Switch the signal generator on with it parked at 0.3 microvolts. Advance the attenuator until we get to 100 microvolts when I want the squelch to come in. It doesn't. When does it come in? Oh, it never comes in. That's a handy squelch, isn't it? Yeah. There we go, that's now set to 100 microvolts on maximum. So once again, we'll park the signal generator at 0.3 of the microvolts, and instead of turning the set off like a fool, set the squelch threshold to minimum. Switch the signal generator on. And it's coming in at 0.6 of a microvolt, and leaving it 0.45 of a microvolt, so it's nice and sensitive. So there we have it. I don't think we've anything, any stone left unturned, but just because we didn't show the um, the transmit power, now it's warmed up a bit. It's it's just over the top at 4.2. Um, sorry, now it's cooled down a bit. It's now over the top at 4.2. We are allowed a 10% um, instrumentation error, so I'm not going to turn it down. We'll leave it there. Yes, I am going to turn it down. Four point one, and we'll just check on the other four on the other channels. Channel one, four point one. Channel forty, four point oh five. So it's pretty well balanced, and uh, once you've had it in transmit for a few seconds, it will um, soon drop down to four. Now I am. So we don't we don't fix mics. Uh, I expect the supplying shops or dealers to do that. But it's like a friend of mine who worked um, for Comet. Who remembers Comet? He was a television engineer for Comet. He'd been a television engineer for me. His name was Stephen. We called him Nana. Because he was a right Nana. And um, he got this job with with Curry's. And this telly had been on... Oh, the phone's ringing. How can that be? Okay, so that's... Uh, it's, all it was is the insulation... Um, the sleeving's just a bit naff. Just uh, I've just pushed it up half an inch. One two one two, wallow. Testing one two one two wallow. So that's uh, testing one two one two wallow. So this 
button on that. I'm only to receive it. Testing one two, testing one two, one two, one two. That's a bit crackly, isn't it? What's crackling? Is anything crackling? No, it's not. Unless it's the switch. That sounds all right. Okay. Right, well, I have every confidence that uh, is going to work. We'll, we'll leave it on while I do um, Mrs. What's It shopping, and uh, I'll be back in a couple of hours. So, before we were so rudely interrupted, I was telling you about my friend Nana. She got this job at, um, at Comet fixing televisions. And this television had been in for repair for some time, under guarantee. I'm going back to days of CRT televisions. I'm telling a story from the 90s. And uh, I think this telly had been in for about five weeks, waiting for a line output transformer. So it takes the telly off the shelf when this transformer arrives. It puts a transformer in, switches the telly on, and everything's working except the remote control. So it suddenly discovers that the remote control doesn't work. Now bear in mind this television didn't work, so you couldn't test the remote control because the telly didn't work. Let's see which one of those is his chassis. So uh, he then discovers this remote doesn't work. So he starts taking this remote control apart. And most of the time, it's an ingress of somebody's coffee in the remote control keypad. So it's much as stripping it down, cleaning it with isopropyl alcohol, putting it back together. So it's just stripping this remote down, and this bloke comes in, bearing in mind Nana's only worked there for a few weeks. So this bloke says, you're supposed to send remote controls to central uh, workshops at Watford. And this was at Rotherham or Sheffield, I'm telling you. Well, goes, well yeah, <laughs> fair enough. But this telly has been five weeks waiting for a part. The part's come. Then I discovered the remote controls. What cloth head pillickers thought of that? Well, I'm the owner and I thought of it. <laughs> and he says, well, that's told you then, hasn't it? <laughs> and that is the reality. So although I'm sure it's a great idea having the repairs for a specific thing like remote controls at a particular branch, there are times when it's impractical. The customer should not have been waiting any longer. And I think Nana did absolutely the right thing in spending 15 minutes sorting out the remote control instead of sending it away and it probably coming back another five weeks later by which time the people who owned the television would have forgotten what it even looked like. I don't know why I was telling you that story because um, time has passed in between. I've had a word with my radio ham friend Stuart and we're going to arrange, because we've got no Mr Chippy have we? We're going to arrange so that I see if I can call him on this from eight and a half, nine miles away where he lives. I think he's going to be in his car. So we'll put this on the aerial. We'll unplug the instrument speaker. We're still in picture in picture. Let's make sure we're on that meter. We are on that meter. It's still transmitting. It is... Spot on frequency, and I've never adjusted that. One microvolt, 0.3 microvolts. So I don't know what effect crystal filters have on these. It's not, it's not something I'd do. So we'll put it on the aerial.
One on the Roger. Right, so we'll await. We'll await his call. So I'll pause the video until the appropriate time. Tango 21. Oh, I've got the... Uh, I can hear myself over the tannoy system. Uh, Tango 21, Electric Man, do you copy? Yeah, Roger, I copy. OK, we're on the Midland 3001, and I'm receiving you fine, thus proving that it's working. Roger, in actual fact, you're coming through because I was in the living room and I heard you come on this set before I heard you come on the one in that room. So that's the higher aerial. It just goes to show that your location is such that this aerial picks you up better, over. Okay, that's excellent. Right, well, thanks for that. I'll say 1010 and we'll get this this radio back to the customer. Okay, cheers. Okay, well. Good. I'm sure we got to the bottom of that. And basically, it was down to that uh, little bit of a capacitor but I've changed the regulator because that will have been shorted out many a time for it to shut down so that's safety then we change that other capacitor because I didn't like the color of it so there we are thanks for watching Midland 3001 yet again <laughs>